If you'd like to turn with me, our Old Testament scripture reading comes from Exodus chapter 3 this morning. You can find it on page 46 or beginning on page 46 in the Blue Pew Bible in front of you. It's a familiar story when Moses encounters the Lord in the burning bush. Hear then the word of the Lord. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. For he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites. And now behold... The cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this, To the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now let us go a three days journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. This is the word of the Lord. Today we're focusing on the doctrine of God, on the character and nature of God himself. And if I'm honest, I think that I, and I think that we, are actually quite inadequate when we come to such a topic. To seek to know God when we are finite creatures, when we are weak in various ways, it's it's, it's kind of futile in a certain way, at least if we try to do it on our own, right? of, of ourselves. But at the same time, it's not futile at all. 
it would be if we were going at it in our own strength, right, according to our own knowledge. But the truth is that God has made himself known. That doesn't mean, however, though he's made himself known, it doesn't mean that we should just haphazardly waltz into thinking about God. We should not rush in with presumption, assuming that we know more or can know more than we do. In the passage we just read, we're shown something of the the glory of God in the burning bush as the Lord appears to Moses. A burning fire that doesn't consume, that just keeps burning. Right? Fire gives heat, it gives light, it represents both destructive power as well as life-giving warmth. But this fire that Moses sees, you notice it says he, he sees it, and it's after a time that he decides to go and actually investigate. Because he, he at first sees it, and it's just a fire, right? It's a bush that's on fire. It might be strange where he is, but it might not be that strange. Maybe it was dry, maybe it had been storming, maybe there had been some kind of fires recently due to lightning strike. It might not have been that strange to him at first, but as he looks at it, he notices that it doesn't burn up the bush. The bush is still there. It doesn't go away. So it's a fire that burns, but it, it's not burning because of the bush. The bush is not the fuel for the fire. It burns all its own. And this tells us something about God himself, that he is not dependent on any other. God does not exist because we think he does. He does not exist because of us. He's not a construct of our own minds. He is self-existent and not dependent on any creature. And this becomes even more clear as God shares his name, the name that he gives to Moses to share with the people of Israel. This was in verse 13. Moses asked him, if I come to the people, who should I say has sent me? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am who I am, or it could technically be translated, I will be who I will be. The name that God gives for himself speaks to his total self-existence. You're completely dependent upon him for life. In him we live, move, and have our being. But he is. He has being in and of himself. He is not like us. In one way, his name reveals this about him. It reveals something about him to us. But in another way, even though he gives his name, it's still shrouded in mystery. It's not entirely clear. There's a level at which we simply cannot fully know God because He's God and we are not. Our knowledge is limited. His name reveals him, but it also conceals him in a certain way. It also speaks, I think, to the fact that God was going to show himself more and more over time. That as the people of Israel saw his mighty hand in bringing them out of Egypt, right, in bringing them to this same mountain in order to worship, in bringing them into the land of promise, and in the wilderness wandering and in his judgment in exile. And on and on, the the people of God would see his character over time. And over time, it would become more and more clear to them. Ultimately, this culminates in the person of Christ. He cannot be summed up all at once, but as we see how he interacts with his people over the history of redemption, and as we behold his glory most clearly in the face of Christ Jesus, we can come to a deeper and deeper knowledge of who he is. So as we come to a topic like the character and the nature of God himself, we should heed the same warning that Moses heard. Take off your sandals. This is holy ground. As we seek to perceive the invisible God, we must do so with humility and reverence. We can have faith that God has made himself knowable 
but we must also submit ourselves to those ways in which he has made himself knowable. We don't get to know God just as we want. Rather, he has revealed himself, and we go to where he's revealed himself, in his word, in the means of grace. John Calvin said this about this passage. Moses, he says, is commanded to put off his shoes, that by the very bareness of his feet, his mind might be disposed to reverential feelings. And on this account, too, he is reminded of the holiness of the ground, because in our prayers, the bending of the knees and the uncovering of the head are helps and excitements to the worship of God. In other words, there are, there are ways in which we come to God. We set aside a particular day. Right? We, we gather together corporately like this. We open up the word of God together. We pray. We, we sing hymns corporately. We do these various things, not as just trite little traditions, but because these are things that God himself has commanded us. And because in doing them, we become more aware of who he is and what he has done for us. So we must, just like Moses, approach God with that humility and reverence. The New Testament reading and sermon text today comes from the book of 1 Timothy. I'll be reading from 1 Timothy 6, verse 11 to 16. I'll give you a moment to turn there if you want to follow along with me. First Timothy 6, beginning in verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. This is God's holy and inspired word for us this morning. Well, today we are uh, beginning a new sermon series that I think will take us pretty much through the whole year. We're going to be uh, using as a starting place, the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, and the Lord's Prayer. These will become basically an outline for us as we're moving forward. And I'm still intending um, that I, and once a month at least for the next few months as Matt still comes and preaches, I'm intending that we would still more or less preach from one particular text, although it may be a little bit more than that. But these would provide more or less the spine, if you would, that would hold everything else together. It seems right to me that as we as a church are kind of moving into a new season, that we kind of pull back a little bit and we return to what are the, the foundations of the faith, the foundational truths. And historically, the Christian church has used these three things for discipleship. This has been the standard of discipleship. Almost every catechism that you'll find from any uh, you know, orthodox, lowercase o, tradition will outline in some way these three things. A summary of doctrine in the Apostles' Creed, a standard for the way that we are to live as Christians in the Ten Commandments, and then really the heart of true spirituality, the heart of, of prayer and communion with God in the Lord's Prayer. Now the Apostles' Creed does not come straight from the apostles themselves. Some early church fathers had this idea uh, that maybe it went all the way back. 
But it is extremely early. We know that uh, even in the second century, it was used um, as part of the uh, baptism of new converts uh, or something very similar to it. And then over time, it, it may have been changed slightly. But we call it the Apostles' Creed because it summarizes for us apostolic doctrine, apostolic teaching. What did the apostles teach? What do we have in scripture that they taught? Well, if we put it all together, the central truths they taught can be summed up in the creed. And the Apostles' Creed begins, I think most of us know it, with I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker, maker of heaven and earth. And so this is where we're starting. We're not going to take all of that at once. It's somewhat hard to decide even, for me anyway, where to begin. Where do you start with something like this? And so I thought it was proper that we start with God himself. We start with the character and person of God. I believe in God. Some earlier versions of the creed would say, I believe in one God, and then go on to say, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In many ways, the doctrine of God has fallen on hard times. I'm convinced that most of us, even in the church, have a really casual view of God. We believe in what some have called divine mutualism, right? We and God, we are mutuals. He's like us. He just happens to be bigger, stronger, smarter. He's better. But he is totally comprehensible. We think that we can relate to him as if he were just a friend, one of our buddies. We're casual and flippant. We're irreverent often in how we treat him. And this, I think, is even a danger in our own church, in our own tradition, though we do generally have a very high view of God. I think what can happen sometimes is we, we learn about the attributes of God, we learn a lot of theological terms about God, and then we think we've covered it, right? God becomes a kind of a topic that we can discuss and figure out, and then we're done. We've, we've found him out. We make our own boxes and categories for God to fit into, and in doing so, try to limit him, try to control him. But ultimately, the creature cannot control or limit the creator. So we're going to look at 1 Timothy here, mostly uh, a portion at the end of what we just read. And uh, particularly, we're going to look at four different aspects to the character of God and then what our proper response to him should be. These different aspects of God are his sovereignty, his immortality, his ineffability, and his incomprehensibility. We have all of these here in 1 Timothy. So let's start with this. God is sovereign. Paul gives this final charge to Timothy here to keep the commandment unstained and free from repro reproach until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he moves into marveling at the nature of God. And it leads to praise, right? It leads to doxology at the end. But he, he breaks out into this kind of doctrinal declaration of who God is. And he begins by saying, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, and Lord of lords. Paul exclaims that God is sovereign. He is the sovereign. He is supremely blessed, he says, or, or supremely happy. When we think of blessing, it's usually in terms of our blessing, right? That, that we are blessed, that God blesses us. It's something that we receive. It's something that God gives. But God is blessed. And this is what I will come back to over and over again, that, that we receive from him, we take part in his blessing, right? but it, it comes to us from him. He simply is the blessed one. All goodness and happiness and joy, all things come from him and are for him, and so he is not in need that something should be added to him. Right? No one needs to give him anything. He's not needing anything from us. Nothing is a gift to him in a literal sense because he has everything. Everything is simply his. 
Now there's another way in which we could say, of course, we bring offerings, we bring gifts to him as he has commanded. But we do that understanding it's all his anyway. He owns it all. The cattle on a thousand hills. He is the blessed and only sovereign. The singularity of God is, is shown forth in this passage multiple times. Right? He is the only. He alone. Right? No one else is like him. All things are in his control and power. Nothing is outside of his purview. Now, one of the ways that you can spot a false view of God is any time someone wants to, to try to limit him. Anytime somebody wants to try to limit God on the basis of creation. There's a regular desire to limit God's sovereignty out of concern that otherwise it might create some kind of imposition on us. We have to limit his freedom because otherwise it might affect our freedom. We have to limit his foreknowledge because otherwise it might limit our choices. We have to limit his authority because otherwise we might not be able to understand how he can be both just and in complete control of all things. So we, we start with us, we start with where we're at, with our knowledge, with our understanding, we say, how does God fit into that? I was recently in a discussion with someone about uh, the uh, doctrine called open theism, uh, false teaching called open theism. Open theism is an idea that's become more and more popular over the last, I don't know, several decades. It's the idea that God has self-limited his knowledge of the future in order to preserve human freedom. And usually the, the impetus of this is that it will help to uh, make God more understandable. Um, it will allow us to still be completely free. But in this doctrine, God is just experiencing history with everyone else, right? He's, he's just like us. He doesn't know any more than us. It's a historically novel understanding, but often it's said to make God much more empathetic, right? He understands more. He, he gets things more as to what you're going through in your life. It somehow preserves him. And that's exactly the kind of approach to God that you need to be wary of, right? That, that impetus. Ultimately, it comes from the sinful nature, Right? Our desire to limit God so that in some way it will work better for us. Right? I need God to work better for me. Well, that's, that's not how you begin to know God. Right? You'll, you'll start to see how the, the world is and how you operate, what you like, and then say, well, how does God fit into that? Right? He has to make himself work around me, in other words. But ultimately, God cannot fit into this, whatever this is. Because God is God. Right? You are a, a creature, you're finite, you're limited. We approach God and we come to him, He, not to us, at least not in this sense that we're talking about. He is the only sovereign, governing everything according to his own will. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, it says. He's not given authority as we see fit, or as any sees fit. He's not democratically elected or rejected. He has power and authority completely in himself. He has it. It's, it's not given to him. He has it. All kings and lords and rulers and governors on earth derive authority from the fact that he has authority. But it doesn't go the other way. He doesn't gain authority when somebody in power says we should worship him as God. He is God either way. He has power and authority either way. It's just a question of whether or not you recognize it. Calvin says this, that the sum of it is that all the governments of the world are subject to his dominion, depend upon him, and stand or fall at his bidding. 
But that, the authority of God, is beyond all comparison. Because all the rest are nothing as compared with his glory. And while they fade and quickly perish, his authority will endure forever. So God is sovereign. And the text continues to teach us that God is immortal. It says, who alone has immortality. So God is sovereign and God is immortal. Now once again, much like speaking of the the blessing or authority of God, you might think, wait a minute, don't we have immortality or can't we have immortality? So how can it be said that God alone is immortal? Is that really correct? But that's what it says, he alone is immortal. And in the strictest sense, God is the only one that has immortality and that he cannot die. To put it positively, we could say God alone has life. Or God alone is life. He has life in himself. He alone lives in and of himself. Earlier, Paul has said that God gives life to all things. You only live then because he gives life. He gives you life. You only have life in as far as you share in the life that he has. As we've already said today, as it's mentioned elsewhere, in him we live, move, and have our being. Your existence is predicated upon him. Right? You, you are a creature. He is the creator. So God exists in the ultimate sense. He exists and we, we subsist. We We are alive under him, by him, through him. This is why death, both physical and spiritual, comes as a result of walking away from God, of rebelling against him. It's to remove yourself from the very possibility of life because God is life. Life is not something that God takes part in. It is him. This is why Christ can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I want you to really think about this. And I know we can't exhaust it here, but it's so easy to just, we're alive, and so we just assume. This is just something that we we get, right? It's it's just a part of, of what we should just have. We deserve it, right? We, it, we just take it for granted. But all of life is a gift. Any life is a gift because it means that God has seen fit to share. Now we're dealing with ultimate things here, so I know that our language is breaking down at times. I know that there are going to be things that I say in this sermon that there will be questions about because when we're dealing with ultimate things, when we're dealing with God himself, right, in his nature, in his essence, we start to struggle to be able to describe it all. So sometimes we say things that they they almost sound contradictory. God is one in three. It's not contradictory, but it almost sounds that way. We live and we just take it as a given. And in one sense it is, right? I mean, we, it is a gift. It is given, but life isn't owed. That's the point, right? You didn't earn it. Uh, you don't have it in and of yourself as something that's yours it's it's all a gift the fact that you exist at all is only because god exists if you share in the divine nature because you've been united with christ you are immortal in the sense that you have eternal life but recognize that this is because of him, right? And not in an abstract way, because he is eternal life. If you've been a part of the the Thursday night Zoom Bible study, we've been working through 1 John. And in 1 John, eternal life is personified because Christ is eternal life, right? Eternal life is not a thing that God gets and then gives as much as it's him. It's to, to know him, to be united to him. That is to have true life. 
You participate in him and so have it. He is your life. And when we appear with him, when he appears rather, we will also appear with him in glory. So God is sovereign and God is immortal. He is. He doesn't get those things. It's not like us. He is sovereign. He is immortal. And he is ineffable. Ineffable describes something that is too great or too extreme to describe in words. And it's what I'm going to try to use as the word to describe what Paul is communicating here when he says that he dwells in unapproachable light. God dwells in unapproachable light. Another way I could have said this is that God is unapproachable. And that's true in a sense. I just don't want you to get the wrong idea. Because we can approach God. This this is part of the, the miraculous nature of the incarnation. That Christ has come and dwelt among us. And through him now we can know and behold the living and true God. But in his, in his essence, ultimately, we will never know God fully. We'll go on knowing him more and more forever, but we, we cannot know him fully because he is God. There will always be limits on us. And in that sense, God is unapproachable. In his being and essence, you cannot approach him. The more you know God the more you can know him, and also the more you're aware that you do not fully know him. All at the same time. The fact that God dwells in unapproachable light tells us something of the ineffability of his nature. You're not going to be able to describe him fully, nor can his essence be described fully by words alone. Our words will always fall short of his glory. All analogies fall apart ultimately because they they can't creation which we take analogies from cannot fully describe the creator but they can help right And, and god does this throughout scripture as he he uses analogies from creation to try to help us move in the direction of understanding him more god is like the sun then He dwells in unapproachable light and in some senses like the sun. If you look right at the sun, your eyes will stop being able to see. You'll be able to see less and less as you look right at it. You see light, but you aren't seeing the sun itself. And to look directly at it does cause blindness over time. St. John Chrysostom used the sea as an analogy for this aspect of God. He says a thing is unapproachable, which from the start cannot be investigated, nor can anyone come near to it. We call the sea incomprehensible because even when divers lower themselves into its waters and go down to a great depth, they cannot find the bottom. We call that thing unapproachable, which from the start cannot be searched out or investigated. He he cannot be searched out. God is unapproachable or ineffable, as I'm saying, in that the closer you try to get to him, the greater you recognize he is. The less you feel that you can grasp him, the more you know him. God defies your categories. As we speak about him, we must know that what we say is always inadequate. We, We often can know God more than we can communicate and we, we know him less than he is. So our words are always going to be inadequate to a certain extent. Paul often spoke about the nature and character of God. He does so here, right? He speaks about who God is and yet when he was taken up into the third heavens and saw the glory of God, He comes back and he says that he heard things which cannot be told, which man may not utter. Right? That that there's this level of of knowing and experiencing God that he he can't even begin to communicate. This is what I'm calling the ineffability of God. 
And very closely tied to it is this last point about the incomprehensibility of God. God is incomprehensible. It says, whom no one has ever seen or can see. We think of light. You know, it says that he dwells in unapproachable light. We think of light as something that reveals. Right? We have lights on. We can see better. It allows us to see. But the light of God's glory, the light he's concealed in, we're told is like thick darkness. The glory cloud that surrounds God often appears as a cloud. This light is so much and so bright that it actually doesn't allow us to fully see. God is spirit, and so he is invisible, not seeable, which means you cannot fully perceive him. It means you cannot fully comprehend him. You cannot fully grasp or understand God. Again, because you're, you're a finite creature. You are, you are limited in what you can do. You cannot fully grasp the infinite. Imagine for a moment that you had a teacup in your hand and you went out beside the ocean and you thought, I'm going to get it all in here. Or I'm going to put the whole ocean in this teacup. It's an obvious absurdity. Even if we started smaller, right? You just go out to the river right next door here. Well, you can't, you can't even begin to fill up that little cup. This is what it's like to, to think that we would, we would totally grasp, totally comprehend the infinite God. Or imagine, if you would, that you set out to comprehend simply all the, the words that have been written. That is a much smaller task than trying to comprehend God. But start to think about it. And I know this seems like it's absurd to even think about. Obviously, you couldn't do that. But actually think about it for a moment. Just start in front of you. Right? If you just set out right, what's right in front of you, you've got a Bible, you've got the Trinity hymnal. If you just set out to say, I'm just going to memorize every word here. I'm going to totally comprehend and understand, memorize all of these words. That would take most of us, maybe the rest of our lives. But let's just say that you could. You could take care of that. Okay, now like, just move out to the church. Right? Think about all the books in the library, in my library. Think about all the different things that might have written words on them, just in this building. I don't think that we could get out of this building in our lifetime. If we wanted to, full, again, fully comprehend... But let's say that you had a photographic memory and somehow you were able to get out of this building. Well, now think about all of the, the houses and businesses, the libraries, everywhere that you might find a written word in La Crosse. It, it seems nearly infinite, just even as you get that far. Right? That's, a, that's just an absurd amount. And now move it out further. Right? Everything written in Wisconsin the United States, North America, the world. Now add everything that's just ever been written. Right? Think through all of history, written on stone tablets or the walls of caves or papyrus or parchment or vellum or paper. Think about all the books, all the flyers and newspapers and magazines. Now think about every word that's written online. Right? Every blog, every article, every tweet. You can't even begin to comprehend the words written. And that's just a tiny fraction of the information that could be learned about creation, about this world. That's just a tiny fraction, right? Add all the words that have ever been spoken. All of this, something to be learned, to be, to be known, to be comprehended. But you couldn't even begin to find it all out, to search it out. Think about the molecular structure of every blade of grass, or the atoms in every tree, or the stars in every galaxy. All of it created by God, but none of this is God. Think about how vast and, 
and massive what you would have to know just to know creation. And none of it is God. God has made all of this. Take that next step and think about how incomprehensible, totally incomprehensible, even what what little is within your grasp right now is to, and then think about how ridiculous it would be to think that we could, we could totally comprehend God, like the God who we cannot see. How much more incomprehensible is he? And the point is that as we approach God as if he were just us, but a little bit bigger, there is a, a sense in which we think that we can conceive of him fully, comprehend him fully, and thus we, we limit him. Don't limit God to something that you can conceive of. Because ultimately, that's not going to be God. It's not to say that you cannot know God or know things about God. He has made himself known. But when we're talking about comprehending completely, that can't be God. You're made in God's image. He's not to be made in yours. And this is ultimately, that's the foolishness of idolatry. The foolishness of of rationalism or the foolishness of anything that you might worship because it is comprehensible, because it is controllable, because it is calculable. But God is incomprehensible. Now I know we've barely touched these four points. We've just grazed over them, that God is sovereign, he is immortal, he is ineffable, and he is incomprehensible. But we do need to bring things to a close. I thought when I was first setting out to write this sermon that we would also cover that God is triune. (laughs) And then it just became very obvious that that was ignorant of me, and so we will return to that at a later time. But this is where we start with God himself. But where does Paul close? Where does this lead? As he's, as he's describing the nature and character of God, where does that bring him in this text? To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. The proper and really the only response to knowing God in what little way we can know him is worship. And actually, God has decided that he would meet us in worship, and this would actually be one of those means that he makes himself known to us. We are to ascribe to him honor. If if we are concerned that God be understandable and comprehensible, that he be my mutual, and if we're worried when we come face to face with the true God and get anxious, what, what if... What if I can't control him, right? What, what, if, what if I have to submit something unto him rather than the other way around? What, if we are nervous about this, it's because we've had an idol in our mind about who God is. But where this actually leads, when you see in what way we can see the the glory and the grandeur of God, it naturally, it properly leads to worship, to adoration, to recognize him as the one who is due eternal dominion, right? Total sovereignty over our lives and over all. We're not going to labor on this point because I do think it's more fitting that we actually do it, right? That we we are going to sing. And we're doing that in response. As we behold God from his word, we respond in singing. But in closing, then I hope you have some more sense of the nature of God, that he is the only true sovereign, the only one who has life in himself, that he is unapproachable and incomprehensible, and yet has made himself known to us in a way that we can know specifically through Jesus Christ, the very word of God. This is the God we speak of when we say together, I believe in God.
Would you pray with me? Lord God, we do pray that as we have heard your word, that you would humble us, that it would not be overwhelming in a way that crushes us, but it would be overwhelming in a way that we simply want to be in awe of you and respond with hearts of service and worship. Please help us now as we do just that. Take these words. Please do not allow them to quickly leave us. Rather, take your word and plant it deep within our hearts that it might grow up and produce much fruit for you. In Christ's name, amen.